I'm just going to wait. Uh, I'll just wait a few minutes, uh, Rishi, to let the participants join. Sure. A few more seconds here. Okay, um, it's six oh one, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start. I want to say a good evening and happy new year to all. Welcome and uh, thank you for joining us for today's public listening session regarding the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs draft environmental justice strategy. My name is Carlene Lemoyne, Deputy Director of Environmental Justice for External Stakeholder Coordination. And with me is Rishi Reddy, Director of Environmental Justice. Um, just uh, one moment, I am going to share my screen so that I can pull up uh, the webinar, I mean, not the webinar, the uh, agenda. Just one moment, please. Okay. Thank you for your patience there. Okay, uh, as you can see on the agenda of today's listening session, I will briefly go over the logistics. Oh, I have the wrong slide up, but my apologies, that was this morning agenda, but it's still the same, only the time is different. Uh, so once I go through the logistics, uh, Rishi Reddy will give an overview presentation on the draft environmental justice strategy. Then after the presentation, uh, we will open the platform for oral comments. Uh, I want you all to know that uh, you can also find the presentation, uh, the agenda, as well as the draft environmental justice strategy in multiple languages on our website. I will put the link to our website in the chat uh, for your convenience uh, shortly. We also have a survey in multiple languages containing questions uh, targeted on community engagement, metrics, grants, uh, language services, and so on, which uh, you'll receive a copy of uh, following uh, this listening session. So before we get started, uh, we'll just go over the logistics for this listening session. As you all know, uh, this session is being recorded we have six interpreters present to provide simultaneous interpretation between English and Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, Vietnamese, Cavardian Creole, and Mandarin. We also have two sign language interpreters. At the bottom of your screen, you will see an interpretation globe. Please click on the globe and select a language channel to hear the interpretation in your chosen language. If you speak English, please select the English channel. With interpretation channels, muting original audio is optional. However, we strongly recommend that uh, muting, uh, muting the original audio. If you choose not to, um, you will still hear the voice of the actual speaker faintly in the background, but mostly you will hear the voice of the interpreter. If you dialed in to participate, you automatically join the audio channel and cannot listen to language interpretation. Language interpretation, unfortunately, is only available from uh, computer audio. Today's listening session is a very important source of information for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs relative to the draft environmental justice strategy. When you make your comment, 
I ask that you please speak in a loud, clear voice and at a moderate pace as best you can to ensure an accurate interpretation. If participants comment in a language other than English, for example, Spanish, the interpreter will use the consecutive method and not real time or simultaneous interpretation. The reason is the interpreter has to switch back and forth between channels in order to interpret to English. That said, the interpreter may ask you to pause in between sentences. So I ask that you be mindful of the interpreter and of course be patient with the process. Please do not use the Q&A to write your comment. If you have questions regarding anything I've said so far, you may use the Q&A box to write your comment. For those intending to provide comment when it is time, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Selecting this function would alert me that you intend to make a comment. You may also use the raise hand function if you have a question about today's presentation. For participants who dialed in and wishes to raise their hands to comment or ask questions when it is time, please press star nine to do so. I will call your names in the order you raised your hands. You will note that um, after I call your name, uh, you will uh, note a notification or pop-up window on your screen that says the host will like to promote you to be a panelist. Please remember to click join as panelists. When you are brought over to the panelist screen, you need to have your language channel set to the language you are using as an attendee. I will ask that you state your full name and affiliation if you are not affiliated with an organization or company, simply state your first and last name. To ensure that as many people as possible can speak today, participant will have two minutes to make their comments. Considering we have a smaller group this evening, you are welcome to go over the two minutes mark, but I want to remind everyone to please speak at a moderate pace. Suppose, Everyone decides to speak. Uh, so far, we have uh, a little over a dozen people. Um, I will try to do my best uh, to keep track of time and remind you 30 seconds before the two minutes mark, I'll just pull up a sign that says 30 seconds. And then at the two minutes Mark, I'll pull up a sign that reads uh, time uh, to let you know that to wrap up. If you did not complete your comment, once everyone who wishes to comment has had the opportunity to speak and there is time left, I can make a note to call back your name or you can raise your hand again after we have gone through the list. In order to reduce background noise, your microphone is muted at all time, except for when you are promoted to panelists to make your comment. If you do not have any questions, with all that being said, um, Without any further ado, I will turn it over to Rishi Reddy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carlene, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for attending today. Uh, it's crucially important for us to hear from you on the draft environmental justice strategy. We just cannot do this work without you. So I'm very grateful for you giving us your time and expertise and opinions here today. Um, Carlene, I'll just wait for you to. Uh, sure. The... Yes. Thank you. It will just this, take a moment. Thank you. This is a brief 15 to 20 minute presentation on the background of the EJ strategy and uh, what we're hoping to gain from these sessions. Now, the next slide, Carlin. So this slide is talking about um, EEA's, the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. 
um, our mission. And um, it's talking about the fact that our secretary is a member of the governor's cabinet. We oversee six energy and environmental agencies for Massachusetts. And our mission is to protect the Commonwealth's land, water, air, and wildlife, and also plan for our energy needs into the future and guide Massachusetts in adopting a cleaner energy supply. Some of the ways that we do this are to give grants to municipalities and community-based organizations for parks and green space, climate resiliency projects, clean energy, agricultural operations, and other projects. Our agencies also issue permits that protect our natural resources. And we also develop and enforce energy, environmental, and climate law. Next slide, please, Colleen. What is the document that we are discussing today? It's primarily a guidance document for state staff. Your comments today will help us create better guidance for state staff to do their jobs in an equitable way. That means setting environmental policy, developing regulations, and interpreting our laws. We will take your comments that you give us today back to our offices, and we will consider the ways that they can improve the EJ strategy, which is currently in draft form. We'll make changes to the draft strategy, and then we'll issue a final strategy, which will include your input sometime later this spring. Next slide, please, Carlene. What is the EJ strategy? We at EEA are aware that inequities exist in terms of energy and environmental burdens across the Commonwealth. In its final form, the EJ strategy will guide our staff and agencies to fulfill our mission with equity as the primary consideration. We are striving for climate justice, environmental justice, and energy justice in the Commonwealth. And we need your comments to make this the best final document that it can be. Next slide, please, Connie. This slide talks a little bit about the timeline for the issuance of the strategy. It was first released on November 9th of last year, and our public comment is stretching until January 27th. We are holding several listening sessions so that we can gain oral comment on the strategy. That's the one today is two remote uh, um, listening sessions. Last month, we had one in person in Springfield. Next week, they will be one in person in Roxbury. And we are anticipating having at least one more in uh, the near future. The public comment period is open for written comments too. They can be submitted via the website at an email um, uh, address for a free form type of written comment. You can also, if time is short, please go to the EJ uh, Strategy website and look at the link for the survey. And there are several concise questions there that are of most concern to us and you can answer in a more quick way. After we get everybody's comments in oral and written, we will be looking at those in our offices and we will be issuing a final comment after we've incorporated edits. And we will also be issuing a response to comments document, for instance, for any comments that we were not able to incorporate with the rationale of why we could not. And again, we anticipate the release of this strategy later on this spring. Next slide, please, Carlene. As Carlene alluded to, the draft EEA EJ strategy is available online in the following languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, Haitian Creole, Vietnamese, Arabic, Khmer, Russian, and Cape Verdean Creole. Other languages are also available upon request. And there are a few hard copies of the uh, strategy floating around 
we would be able to mail you one if you submitted a request to us, um, but it is available online. We want as many people to have it as possible. Next slide, please, Colleen. This slide depicts the number of agencies and offices that are under the EEA umbrella. So this, we have a description of the smaller agencies and offices that has its own separate mission and job. Each of these smaller agencies created their own EJ strategy chapter, which you will see if you review the document. Then we put all those chapters together and created one comprehensive strategy for the entire secretariat. Basically, you will see in the document initiatives dealing with agriculture, climate, energy, and environment together. Next slide, please, Carleen. In putting the strategy together, we required all of the agencies to do the following, which were required under an environmental justice policy. All of the agencies and officers were required to propose initiatives that promote EJ in all neighborhoods across the Commonwealth, integrate environmental justice considerations into their departments through policies, programs, enforcement, grant making, and other strategies, identify and promote agency-sponsored projects, funding decisions, regulatory rule makings, and distribute, and excuse me, demonstrate the fair distribution of benefits have been measured. This piece is, I feel, of the utmost importance. We need to figure out how we are able to measure where we are in terms of environmental justice compliance at this point in time, and then figure out metrics and ways that we can measure our progress going forward. So I'm hoping that we will get some input today on through your knowledge of your neighborhoods and where you live, um, how we might be able to measure how well we're doing and where we are now. Um, ultimately, as we said before, this is one comprehensive strategy and it will be sent out under the auspices of the secretary at a date in the future. Next slide, please, Carly. This slide is a depiction of the Environmental Justice Task Force. The draft strategy was developed by the members of this task force, which was first convened in September 2020. This slide shows all the folks who helped write it. It was a pretty uh, comprehensive group effort. And you can see the expertise they have and the agencies that they represent. I also wanna state that these folks are the primary uh, point of contact for environmental justice matters in their agency. So if you see somebody or an agency there that you would like to contact, Please take note of who's representing that particular agency. You can contact them via their email address, which is available online. Um, next slide, please, Carmen. The, in spring of 2021, the EJ office held comprehensive focus sessions with the public to talk about issues concerning climate, energy, environment, and agricultural justice in the Commonwealth. We had about 200 people participate, and a lot of that information formed the basis of the knowledge that went into the draft of the strategy at this time. Next slide, please, Carmen. You'll notice in the EJ strategy that some things are common across all of the agencies and some items are tailored to the specific mission of each agency. As I mentioned before, metrics are very important across all the agencies. How can we measure environmental harm in a neighborhood or energy burden in a neighborhood? So that as we're working through equitable policies and rulemakings, we know how much of an improvement we've been able to achieve. 
Other aspects that the agencies have highlighted in common are equity in hiring, communication and public outreach, stakeholder engagement, and comprehensive training both for internal staff as well as proposals to do training with external stakeholders so that they can better communicate how to utilize the services that government offers. There are some pieces that are individual aspects for each agency, for instance, specific grant programs, specific enforcement obligations, types of cumulative impact analysis, and technical assistance opportunities that each agency offers within its area of expertise. Next slide, please, Carleen. So we need your help. We ask you to comment on anything in the strategy. We're happy to take any comment at all. Two issues, as I said, that are particularly important to us is how to measure progress in your neighborhood and the first issue listed here, how can we best reach out and communicate with members of your neighborhood or your community about environmental energy and climate issues? We've realized that we have a real barrier there from other listening sessions and we're happy to take down any sort of um, recommendations to help bridge that gap. Um, next slide, please, Carleen. We're just asking for public comments and questions. Carlene correctly said with this small group that we can certainly go over the two minute mark um, once we've been through the first round of um, submitted comments. And Carlene, with that, I will hand it back to you to see um, who might be up first with uh, a comment. I think you're muted, Carmine. Yes, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we do have one person, uh, Kathy Watericris. I will promote you to panelists. Hi, Kathy, could you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Um, I just read the questions today and I did comment on a few. Um, I live in an environmental justice zone. I have contacted agencies and I just gotta say that if you live in this zone and you see problems, you call, you look up, you call a government agency and you get the runaround. I've had it so many times before. I hope you can address this. Like, even if I contact somebody at DEP and they don't know the answer, they shouldn't just leave it. Like I contacted somebody in November of last year and I have not heard a word from them since. But we have serious air and you know pollution problems down here. And there's just no place for the average citizen to go. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, we've gone to, you, you go to the Board of Health, you don't get an answer. You start on the lower level and you try to go up and you can't get an answer and no, it seems like you're alone and nobody can help you. I feel like that's how everybody feels who lives in this neighborhood. There's just nothing that can be done. We need more outreach. I feel like the government, the agencies should be out there. When I call and I ask for, you know, trucks are going by with uncovered loads and I don't see anybody come out, then, you know, you feel like there's nobody listening. You know, I just found out I lived in an environmental justice zone. I talked to Deneen Simpson back in 2015 when we had a neighborhood group. Couldn't get an answer. Thank you, Valerie Cardozo, for telling us that, giving us that information. So helpful. I feel like government agencies just give you the runaround when you try to contact them. And I feel that needs to be addressed within this agencies, with all these agencies. If I'm calling for an issue, 
I'd like some type of resolution or even a referral to whoever could help us. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez, could I uh, just ask you what uh, neighborhood you live in, if you don't mind? I'm in Taunton, Massachusetts. I'm Taunton. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Uh, next, we have Ms. Rubin. Stacy Rubin, I will bring you to two panelists. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Carlene Lemoyne. I want to extend my deep gratitude to this group for putting together the environmental justice strategy. This document has been required by state law since 2015. And I know that several people whose faces are on the screen have been trying for many years to make this happen. So I just wanna thank you deeply for getting this over the finish line and out to the public for comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A couple of comments tonight, I will certainly follow up with written comments uh, likely to be filed from the Massachusetts Environmental Justice Table. First, a key priority, um, at least from Conservation Law Foundation's perspective, is that when state agencies are getting feedback from residents and community members, that feedback should influence a state agency's decision making. All input that an agency receives should be responded to in some way in final decisions, and an agency should explain why they are making the decisions that they are making. So my hope is that the final version of the environmental justice strategy can reference that commitment for all of the agencies. Next, I'm sorry, I should have introduced myself. <laughs> uh, I am Stacy Rubin. I am the Vice President of Environmental Justice at Conservation Law Foundation, and I'm a proud member of the statewide coalition working on environmental justice, the Massachusetts Environmental Justice Table. Uh, next, I wanted to say that the State law on environmental justice allows for some neighborhoods that are not designated as environmental justice populations to request to opt in to become designated as an environmental justice population. It would be great for the final environmental justice strategy to provide some guidance about what information the Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretary will consider in order to decide whether to grant that um, petition to opt in. And I just wanna give a couple of specific places of feedback um, for some of the agencies. For the Department of Environmental Protections, I want to note that um, I got to see an early draft of this strategy I provided comments and the final, or at least the draft version that came out reflects those comments. So I'm really grateful to the Department of Environmental Protection staff for incorporating those edits. We'd like to see that um, MassDEP talk about the enforcement actions that they're taking and if they're getting money from a company who's polluting and violating the law to explain how that money is being used to further environmental justice, to make sure that community members can advance ideas for how that money gets spent. We'd also like to see Mass DEP commit to pollution reduction targets to address the ongoing disproportionate burdens on air quality issues in environmental justice populations. And I will further note, we'd like to see MassDEP commit to real consideration of environmental justice when looking at solid waste facilities. There are a number of solid waste facility expansions or new ones being proposed in environmental justice populations throughout the Commonwealth. 
Next is the Energy Facility Siting Board. I am deeply disappointed with this strategy. It doesn't reflect any real change to how decisions are currently made. And we have seen time and again the Energy Facility Siting Board approve projects that have uh, harmful impacts in environmental justice communities. We'd like to see an advanced um, outreach from the project proponent before filing with the Energy Facility Siting Board and to have staff from the Siting Board be involved and make sure that there's real communication between a project proponent such as a utility or developer with the impacted communities. We would also like to see an update to the Siting Board's language access plan. It is abysmal and there's been a history of poor language access between the Siting Board staff um, in communities that require language translation and interpretation. We'd also like the Siting Board to include uh, evaluation of environmental and public health impacts of a proposed facility that's going through review in an environmental justice population compared to what that impact would be for a non-environmental justice population. And we would like the Siting Board to commit to doing an assessment of how to determine if energy infrastructure is equitably distributed between EJ and non-EJ populations. Lastly, I'll talk about the Department of Public Utilities. Environmental justice should be a factor in all of the DPU decision-making documents where environmental justice populations are impact, impacted. Um, there are disproportionate burdens on certain utility proposals which are ignored. We'd like to see that referenced and corrected in the final version of the environmental justice strategy. We also recommend an Office of Public Engagement within the DPU, similar to what we're seeing at public utility commissions in California or Texas or at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I know I have taken up more than my two minutes. We will provide additional details in writing, but thank you again so much for holding this conversation tonight and for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ms. Rubin. Those are very informative um, comments and I look forward to seeing the written comment um, in greater detail. And I also wanna thank Ms. Rodriguez for uh, bringing the subject to light about not being able to get somebody that you need to get to and an answer. These are um, already this evening has been a great evening. So thank you both for that. Great, thank you, Ms. Rubin. Next, we have Carmen Martinez. I will promote you to the panelist. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. My name is Carmen Martinez, and I am a resident of Lynn, Massachusetts, an environmental justice community. And I am very concerned about the presence of wind waste sagas, since it's the oldest incinerator in the country. But the scariest part is they're unlined and uncover ash dump. Modern landfills are built using a layering system designed to safely isolate waste and monitor any leaks that can harm the environment. Isolating the trash from air and water is vital for preventing contamination. Some landfills use clay to first line the bottom then plastic on top to reinforce it. On top of the liner, they have a storm water drainage system that filters out both the liquids produced by trash and the water collected from rain and snow. They also have underground drainage system that is used to specifically filter out the liquid produced by trash. This is called leachate. The Sagas ash dump in close proximity to Lynn 
and other environmental justice communities doesn't meet any of these modern standards. In fact, it was originally a municipal landfill that they started dumping ash on top of. Wind Waste claims this ash dump has a layer of naturally occurring clay underneath, but this doesn't prevent leachate from seeping into the marshes and soil. Arsenic, lead, mercury, and cadmium are four of the many toxic elements that come from this ash. So my question here is, why is the state still allowing wind waste to dump their toxic ash into an unlined dump in an area of critical environmental concern in close proximity to environmental justice communities? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. We, we heard about um, the site in Lynn earlier this morning as well. So thank you for those comments. Yes. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do raise your hand. If you would like to make a comment. Patrick Morse, I will promote you to panelists. Good evening, thank you so much. Um, thank you to my neighbor, Carmen, for bringing up all of the scientific information and details about the wind waste um, uh, incinerator in Saugus, which neighbors my community in Lynn. Um, I'm a high school teacher here in Lynn and a lifelong resident of the North Shore. I grew up in Nahant, right across the Lynn Harbor from the Saugus incinerator. And I just wanted to provide some commentary about my experience and also my realization of what has been going on with the wheel abrader incinerator, or I'm sorry, excuse me, wind waste incinerator. Um, growing up, I always assumed that it was part of the GE plant and um, being a member of the community, like I just assumed that that was an energy stack or something and coming to the realization as a new homeowner uh, in the area that this was polluting and like creating unsafe conditions, not just for me as a neighbor, uh, as a resident of the neighboring community, but also as a teacher uh, in the community who sees the impact um, in the rates of asthma and the problems with cancer rates in, in Lynn. Um, I've just become completely disgusted. And I wanted to raise my comment here today because I grew up thinking I was living in a beautiful, natural area that respected and loved its resources, um, a fishing community that was vibrant and continues to struggle because of environmental factors. And to see this uh, incinerator continue to be in the skyline just offend. and so that's why I wanted to provide my commentary. I, I really would like to see this commission and this uh, group pay some closer attention to our area, uh, uh, environmental justice community, and um, I really appreciate the attention. So thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Morse. I, if I might, just ask. Um, uh, the, the two people who spoke from Lynn, um, is there an organized group um, or a set of citizens that are advocating around this issue? Is there a name of a community-based organization um, or more than one that we could take note of? So I, um, my name is Patrick Morris speaking again. I uh, volunteer with Neighbor to Neighbor, uh -huh. um, which is a, community-based volunteer organization. Um, and we've been aware of it. Um, however, we know that there are environmental, and that, that community organization 
focuses on a number of issues. Um, and this was brought to my attention through some of our partner organizations. Is there anyone that's um, working on this issue in particular? Um, of those partner organization with, with neighbor to neighbor or, or, is, or do you feel neighbor to neighbor is really the one where a lot of these opinions are coalescing? Neighbor to neighbor has a part of it. Um, Carmen is my neighbor and I know that she has organized and worked with other people um, as well. Um, Carmen, can you speak to that question in any greater detail? Uh, Carmen, I will promote you to panelists. Thank you, Mr. Morris. So we don't have any affiliation with anyone else besides of uh, neighbor neighbor. We've met with the mayor here in Lynn um, and well, other other um, government persons, but no one, no organization like aside of neighbor to neighbor directly working towards the wind waste, um, the wind waste saga issue. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, and I just want to question also. For the folks who've spoken here um, about Lynn today, and also I think there were two or three this morning, um, I think we have your, Carlene, we should have captured their email addresses. That is correct. We have okay, their so, contact. So we can, we will reach out to you all. We'll be in touch about this because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of comment about this. It's all similar. Um, facts that you're all um, uh, submitting here. So I, I very much like to be in conversation with you all about it. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to um, to write us back about it because this is a very concerning issue and allowing the expansion of the ash dump will be well, something very critical and it's actually in an ACEC. So I don't know how this can be allowed by the government, but it's, it's concerning. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate your, your time and attention on it as well as somebody who grew up in the area to hear that there's more people mentioning it and noticing it and that you're taking the pains to uh, reach out to us means a lot. Um, so thank you very much. No, thank you for your, for coming tonight and telling us about it again. Uh, we have Stacy Rubin. Stacy, I will promote you to panelists. I just want to thank the residents of Lynn for speaking up today. It's wonderful to hear their comments. I did just want to note that I am working with the Alliance for Health and Environment, which is based in Saugus, Massachusetts. And that is a group who um, has been fighting the Saugus incinerator owned by Wynn, formerly Wheelabrator, um, both the, the ash landfill as well as the incinerator. So my hope is that um, if you're going to follow up, you can also reach out to the Alliance for Health and Environment. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubin. We don't have anyone else. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, please uh, raise your hand. This is your opportunity to let us know what your concerns are, so. I don't see any hands raised.
I, w- I have in this lull, I just want to um, go back to the first comment that was submitted by Ms. Rodriguez about um, that when one calls the agencies or any other um, state agency about some of the issues com- going on in these neighborhoods, that um, there's no response. I'm wondering if folks have some type of comment on what it would look like to have um, an easier easier access to government officials. Would it be something like one centralized number per agency for a type of uh, complaint? Um, the agencies are very compartmentalized according to their own subject matters that they address. Um, So is it difficult to find out which agency to call? Is that part of the problem? I'm curious about that aspect of um, public engagement. When we were out in Springfield last month in mid-December, we did receive a couple of comments right along the same lines of folks not knowing uh, what was available and whom to call. So I'm wondering if that is, if that's true um, with this group as well. Ms. Rodriguez, I will promote you to panelist. Thank you. I'd like to say about that, that a lot of times you go online and you look under, you know, mass.gov or your city and Sometimes there's forms to fill out. You can file a complaint. And I've done that, but I notice a pattern that people from these agencies will call you on the phone. And that's the end of it. That's all you hear from them. I feel like they should be more accountable and maybe answer via email where it's a public record instead of these phone calls that go nowhere. Just a thought. I mean, I've had a lot of phone calls and nothing gets done. I I do prefer email. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany Blankenship, I will promote you to panelists. And then Patrick Morse. Ms. Blankenship, did you get my notification? Oh yes, here you are. Sorry, everyone is just taking a few seconds to get her on. Uh, I am going to go down to Mr. Morris while we figure out what uh, the technical issue with is with Ms. Blankenship. I, I don't see her on the- Yeah, screen. I think I lost her. I'm not sure what happened. So I will promote Mr. Morris for now. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder just to offer 
an, a thought or an idea rather in addition to um, the suggestion about an email so that there's record I wonder and I know that this is a large undertaking but I wonder if people's um, comments or complaints or um, worries could be assigned to like case managers almost as if there were somebody overseeing and like liaising between the organization um, excuse me or the state and um, the residents who are making these comments and making them known so that not only do residents feel more I guess heard, but also so that there's more accountability on the side of the state, that there is somebody within the agency that we can look to and say, hey, where are things going with this? But also what have you done to bring attention or bring a light to our neighborhood? Because we, you told us you would be working on this. Um, I know that that does take more than just a suggestion, but I thought I might offer it nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. I don't see Ms. Blankenship. So if anyone else has questions or comments, please uh, feel free to raise your hand. I do not see any other hands raised. Um, again, this is your opportunity to, to let us hear your voice, let us hear your concerns. Um, so please use the opportunity uh, to let us know what you think. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, this is the time, so please. In this level, I'd also like to direct people to the question that we have around um, what metrics are most useful um, for um, baseline data in your neighborhoods and also measuring progress. If there's something in particular um, that folks want to put forward for that. I do not see any other hands raised. Um, <laughs> it may be a very short evening. <laughs> it might be. We can always, um, we can end early if there's no further comment. We can give it a minute or two more. Um, sure. Um, okay. I do not see any hands. <laughs> well, in that case, I think we can adjourn if no one else has comments. And Carlene, I can um, just hand it back to you and say, would you like to close out the meeting? Uh, sure. Um, we'll just um, remind everyone um, if you wish to submit written uh, comments, uh, you could email uh, us at ej.inquiries at mass.gov. I will uh, put the contact information in the chat uh, so you can have it. Um, please uh, feel free to submit any written comments um, by the closing um, date, uh, which is uh, January 27, uh, 2023. Uh, we have one in-person um, listening session 
uh, coming up Jan on January 19 at the um, Bruce C. Bolin Municipal Building in Roxbury. Uh, so please uh, go to, on our website if you need more detailed information in terms of the location and so on. And we may also have uh, an additional session. I think Rishi alluded to that earlier. So um, another uh, reminder is that within the next day or two, as I mentioned in my introduction, you will receive a follow-up email survey questionnaire. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you could please, you know, take a moment to complete the survey questions and submit the form back to us no later than uh, the closing date. Also, the recording for this evening uh, will be posted online uh, on the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs uh, YouTube channel. So if there's no more questions or comments, I would like to thank everyone for attending uh, this evening and those providing comments. I hope everyone has a great evening and thank you to all the volunteers who took the time to, to be with us this evening. This thank session is now adjourned. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Carlene. Thank you to the interpreters and the recorders. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.